to do a short introduction, but it's, I'm so glad you all could be here and take advantage of Michael's presence. I was able to go to his program up at the Visitor Center last night, and it was fabulous. And he's going to be back tonight for the uh, Rungus Society Paint, uh, whatever the societies are, to do another auditorium presentation. But this is the only presentation he's and talk that he will be doing right here in the exhibit, which is perfect for all of you because you give the tours in this space. But um, Michael will tell you all kinds of fabulous information. But he is, just so you know, he grew up. He was born in Yosemite. He has, still has a cabin in Yosemite. He lives uh, in Carmel part of the year and in one other place. Fresno. Fresno, thank you, in Fresno. And he, uh, was with Ansel, not on this trip, but he was with his father Ansel on many trips and uh, has some fabulous insights. So welcome Michael Adams. I hope this will be very informal. Uh, well, let me tell you a little about what stimulated this trip. And in 1937, the year before, Ansel was invited by George O'Keefe to come down to New Mexico and travel with her and with, <laughs> with uh, Helen and uh, Godfrey Rockefeller and with George O'Keefe and with uh, McAlpin, David McAlpin. Sorry, sorry okay. about that. <laughs> you don't I, have I, to exit? I think, I think we're all good. <laughs> In 1937, they traveled around the Four Corners area for a couple of weeks, and Ansel took a lot of pictures of Georgia as snapshots, and at the end of that trip, he invited them to Yosemite to come the next year. He said, I'm going to give you a, a pack trip into the backcountry of Yosemite, and uh, they, they sort of semi-agreed, but by next summer, they all agreed to come to Yosemite, and that's where this portfolio was stimulated. Now, they made this trip starting what, the day before, or a couple of days before they went out, Ansel took them up to Glacier Point and showed them sort of the backcountry here that they could see. And they weren't very impressed because you don't see the intimate details of, of the meadows and the streams. You, you're looking at it like from an airplane almost. You don't really get the detail. But the next day, they, or the, whenever they started, they started from the valley. Best Studio is, my grandfather started that in 1902. It's now known as the Ansel Adams Gallery in Yosemite Valley. This is its 114th year in operation. So we predate the Park Service. <laughs> but anyway, they started with this trail, the Snow Creek Trail, camped in Tuolumne Meadows, then went up to Echo Peak. They spent an extra day, I think, there. Took this trip down to Merced Lake, then up which was this trail uh, to Vogel Sang area, and then came here to the Lyle Fork of the Merced, and that was sort of the ultimate goal. And I'll show you something else uh, a little bit later. On the way out, they went to Isberg Pass, back to Washburn Lake, Merced Lake, and back to the valley. And so at the end of the trip, wanted to do something to sort of commemorate it, and he made three portfolios, this being one. This went to David McAlpin, whose widow ultimately presented it to you, this is my understanding. The, George o the one he gave to George O'Keefe is at the O'Keefe Museum in Santa Fe. The one that went to the Rockefellers, I don't know where it went. But there were only three portfolios. He used the basic images, you know, the sort of the, 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 the non-personal pretty much the same in all three portfolios, but each portfolio was, was uh, for each person had a different personal photographs. So in this one for uh, McAlpin, there are probably more pictures of McAlpin in this. The others were slightly different, but basically the same. Um, one of the things Ansel said about that trip was that George O'Keefe really loved it but she didn't really do any painting or sketching on that trip. But I read a note, uh, there was a letter, uh, maybe it's quoted here, a few years later when she wrote to Ansel in the 50s and said this, she remembered it, it was one of the highlights of her life, or in her career, one of her experiences. 
Genesis. So she did get something out of it, obviously. <laughs> but we didn't see any, any uh, of her paintings. We were at the O'Keeffe Museum several years ago, and there was a sort of a retro. Actually, there was a book done. The O'Keeffe Museum did an Ansel Adams, George O'Keeffe book. And there's a painting of a waterfall that looks awfully much like Yosemite. So where George O'Keeffe got that and did that, I don't know. But anyway, uh, walking around this, the portfolio, these are things that Ansel loved. This is an area that he had been in from the 1920s. He knew these places rather intimately and was very happy to show O'Keeffe and the Rockefellers and David Kaplan these areas. And I'm happy to say that I've been to every one of them. A number of these photographs, this one is still available as what we call a special edition print in Yosemite Valley. Uh, from the Pencil Arms Gallery today. A, a number of these, uh, there's a couple more, I think, that are in that category. But uh, I, I would be very happy to answer specific questions. I don't know what, it, it's kind of self explanatory. As you go around, you see the, the pictures of the places they were, you see some of the people who were involved. It was an exciting trip, apparently. They had the five of them on mules. They had four packers to act as guides, cooks, whatever. And they had 14 animals to bring me 14 pack animals. So I'm sure it was a first class pack trip <laughs> with everything that you would get. Most of the people, with one exception, are shown in the exhibit, in, in the pictures of the guides, the packer, and uh, the, the, the various people. So, uh, gosh, what can I say? One, one of the things that's important with this picture here of the group around a campfire, the mountain behind there is now known as Mount Ansel Adams. And the Arizona Tech the Sierra Club, a large Sierra Club group in there several years before this trip. And the Sierra Club were, people were so excited and they liked the area so much, they said, Ansel, we should call this mountain, mountain after you. Well, you can't get a mountain named after you until you die. So <laughs> Ansel always joked about it. But Ansel did tell George O'Keefe and this group that, you know, that mountain, the Sierra Club won't put my name on it. And George O'Keefe apparently told Ansel, and said, aha, that's why you brought us here to show off your mountain. And <laughs> what? I don't know, that was the story. Uh, what more can I say? You have a, a superb series of photographs that are not in the public for the most part. Uh, you have a catalog that was done by the museum here which I understand there's a few left, but it is a stunning catalog of this trip. And it was something very different from what Ansel had ever produced before, um, this kind of book, of a personalized trip. Because he, he wasn't known for portraiture, but a number of these can be considered portraits as you, as you look around. Now, I'm talking specifically about this um, particular exhibit, I don't know, uh, I, I'm really a little bit of loss to, to know. I would love to have some questions that might start me out on a different track. Yes? Is this route that they took still, is it still possible to take that route today? Yes. This trip from Mirror Lake up the Snow Creek Trail and here, it's a, this is a long day even on horseback. But yes, uh, they went along the road. There are trails now. The rest of this is, uh, those trails are in existence today. And the back country of Yosemite, these, these areas up here toward the Lyle Fork and Isberg Pass, the quality of the trail today is not what we would like, but the Park Service doesn't have the money to, uh, to do much on these trails. And one of the wonderful things that's happened in Yosemite there's a 
offhand organization called the Yosemite Conservancy nonprofit, and I have, my wife and I are both on their their board or their council, and as a group we fund three, two to three trail crews every summer to try to work on these backcountry trails in Yosemite, which the Park Service does not have the money to do, but we can support a trail crew to help keep these trails in, in shape. This particular point, uh, Mount Ansel Adams, the Lyle Fork area, it's two days from any trailhead, either walking or on hours. So it's a long way. It's a long way from civilization out there. It's about as far away from civilization that you can get in Yosemite. Yes. Tell us a little, if you know, a little bit more about their friendship, George O'Keefe and Ansel Adams. Ansel met uh, George O'Keefe probably in the late twenties in the Southwest. Uh, George O'Keefe's husband. Alfred Stieglitz was Ansel's sort of guru. He really uh, was impressed with, the, with uh, Stieglitz's work, and in 1933, he finally met him. Stieglitz gave him a, a, a show at his gallery in New York. But Ansel had met uh, O'Keefe in the, like, in the late 20s, 29 or 30. And um, Ansel and my mom made a lot of trips to the Southwest in those years. And one of the trips, uh, about 1939, 29, he also collaborated with uh, Mary Austin to write a book. They cooperated to put a book out on Taos Pueblo. But he was going down there every year, and O'Keefe was there, and they met, and that's what stimulated, I guess, O'Keefe in inviting him in 37 to come for that particular trip. Is there any record of their conversations uh, as they, one talks as a photographer and one talks as a painter. Is there any record of their conversations I, like that? You know, there is a PBS movie on, I think it was on, on Ansel, but, or I'm, I'm sure, where there is some videotaping of Ansel and O'Keefe in Abiquiu at her, at her home of talking, but I can't tell you where they were talking much about art. But there is some film of the two of them together. So that was a wonderful, uh, fortuitous meeting, I think, in those years. They remained friends for many years. And uh, Joe O'Keefe came out to Carmel on several occasions. And I have a one picture in my show that I will, will show tonight, O'Keefe in 1981 in Carmel. But they were good friends, and uh, I think they both like the other's art, and uh, we're very impressed. Do so. you know how the other members of the group happened to be included? On? On this tour, McAlpine and Rockefeller, they, were they were all just friends, or? They were friends. Um, McAlpine is also a Rockefeller, and oh. I just think that they had been friends maybe on the East Coast with O'Keefe and Stegas. I, I don't know the real connection, but one of the important things about David McAlpin, he was on the board of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And in 1940, he got Ansel to become, uh, as, to help them start the first Department of Photography in any museum as a separate department. And Ansel helped them get that started, along with uh, Beaumont and Nancy Newhall, who was an art historian and a very knowledgeable of photography. But that, that McAlpin was the stimulus of that, and through that connection, uh, the Newhalls became good friends, and Nancy Newhall uh, collaborated with Ansel on a number of books, a number of exhibits, and unfortunately, she was here in the Tetons with her husband, and they floated the snake. They loved it so much, they went back up on a second float, and a tree fell on them. Oh, no. And uh, she was hospitalized with a broken femur, and unfortunately, one of the, hopefully uncommon, but side effects is a, a fat embolus went to her brain. And, well, she ultimately passed away, but they loved the Tetons. So that, that was that story. But I'm sure they Could you talk a little bit about how Ansel decided to become a photographer? Oh, sure. Ansel 
Uh, Ansel grew up in San Francisco. He went to Yosemite in 1916. But around 1912, he started playing the piano, and he was self-taught, and his, his parents supported him in his piano, his music, and he went through a number of uh, teachers, piano teachers, who would say to Ansel, I've taught you all I know, you need somebody else. And he went on through several teachers um, to become quite accomplished uh, as a pianist, and he thought that would be his career, to be a pianist. And I've got some wonderful quotes from letters writing to my mom about, uh, you know, they, they met in 21, they were ultimately married in 28, but wrote stories about how his piano, he's teaching and he's moving in, and his photography will be nothing but a hobby. This, this kind of thing. But in 1927, uh, he and my mom and some other people climbed up on the shoulder of Half Dome. So, this is a good picture here of that. I have it in my program, but Ansel had his glass plate camera, and he, the last, next to the last plate, he took uh, this face of Half Dome uh, with the yellow filter, and he realized after he had taken the picture, he was not going to get his result that he really wanted. And so he changed to a red filter, took the picture with his last glass plate, was absolutely amazed when he printed or developed it and printed it after that. But he said, you know, that's the first time I knew what I was doing in a way. I knew how to get what I wanted. And that he always said that, that was probably the beginning of his change from music to photography. And over the next several years, it was obvious that photography was becoming more important. And so he continued to play the piano, and I've got a couple of um, musical episodes in my show. Uh, the show from, actually recorded in 1945. But he gave it up as an idea of a career in the early 30s, let's say. And uh, he played for family and friends over the years. After that, and, and if we could give him a couple of vodkas, he, we get him to play the piano. He enjoyed it. He enjoyed the music. He enjoyed listening to music, piano music especially. And uh, but those early 30s were the sort of the stimulus to move on into photography. Self-taught, he had no courses in photography. He read whatever was being published. In 1935, he wrote a book making photographs published by the Studio Press in London that was sort of the first book talking about all aspects of photography, from building your darkroom to, the, to taking the picture to the negative to the print. And, and it's a sort of a complete story. And it was a, kind of an amazing book, reprinted several times in the 30s. But self-taught and uh, kind of a unique Situation. And did what, did he have a dark room in your home when you were growing up? <clears throat> in you, I grew up in Yosemite. Yeah. As mentioned, we had a dark room there that my grandfather built primarily to take in film and do film processing for visitors. But it was a dark room, and he used it when he was there. But he built a dark room in his family's house in San Francisco, and that was his first major dark room. And also, ultimately, when he moved to Carmel. Uh, 1960, 61, uh, he had it built with a dark room included and a, and a workroom and, and sort of a gallery included in the house. And that's where we live today. Uh, so, yes, there was a dark room available pretty much all the time when I was growing up. And he didn't do many colored. Pictures. Well, that's another fun story because I show in my show, my Exhibit, I show some color. And Ansel took very many color photographs as commercial projects. But the way color worked in those days, you took the picture and sent the film to Kodak. So you had no control over the final picture. And that was what Ansel really could do with his black and white. He did it, he knew what he wanted, he made the, the burning and the dodging and the highlighting certain areas which makes them, they stand out as fantastic images. But he couldn't do that with color. But he took a 
tremendous amount of color. And there were several commercial projects that he took on that wanted color. And if any of you were in New York, probably in the 50s or 60s, Grand Central Station had a Kodak colorama, which was 60 feet long, displaying uh, a slide light uh, on what they would you'd make this huge color uh, transparency and then you would mount it in this form. And you can imagine a 60 foot wide uh, Kodak color film of the Teton. And I don't know which, whether he did the Teton one, but I know it was one of the coloramas they call it. So that, he didn't, he liked color, but he couldn't control it, so he didn't really spend that much time with it. And after he died, the Tr Family Trust printed, published a book of Ansel Adams in color, which I'm not sure he would have <laughs> appreciated, but it was a, it's a stunning book that shows uh, the, the variety of the color work that he did over a lifetime. I saw some. Do you have a personal favorite? Do I? Oh, no. Do I have of these? Mm -hmm. okay. Many of the ones hanging. Do you have a personal favorite? Oh, dear. Well, this one. This one. <laughs> This one is a favorite because we camped in this area. Mm -hmm. I took my wife there uh, early on, and we took our kids there in years and camped in that cathedral lake area. But I like <laughs> And we've also been out on the Lyle Fork with the, this Lyle Fork where the, the picture here around the campfire, we camped at that same site. This is again now my Mansell Adams in, in that valley. And so, it's a box canyon, and it's so difficult to get stock in there. You can take one stick, <coughs> a 10 foot long stick, and push it across the area between some rocks and keep, every, keep all the animals in it. Very remote, but people have found it, unfortunately. <laughs> people go there quite a bit now. Yes? Another favorite of some of us is his photo of the Snake River Overlook up here. And did he come to the Tetons more than once? Well, I was with him in 1942 when he took that. And uh, I don't remember much about it except I remember the view. And that's a very popular image here. It's in the visitor center and you have it up at the Overlook. It's my understanding the Overlook didn't have the road coming right to it at that time. You had to walk over to it. And that's probably what I did and we did. And I, I can't tell I know we have personally, we have several photographs taken at the same time of that scene, but with different cloud effect. So he was there long enough to catch a number of different cloud uh, pictures of the Tetons and the Snake River. And it's fun to look at them. Uh, probably Did he come here some. more than once? He came here many times. I came here with him in 42. I think that might have been his first trip here, but I came back with him again in 46, I think in 48. And uh, the story there is in 1940, 39 or 40, Harold Ickes, the Secretary of the Interior, wanted him, hired him to be a photo muralist. He wanted photographs blown up in the mural size of the national parks to put into the Department of Interior building in Washington. And that was the reason for, I went with him in 1941 on my first trip. We went to the National Parks and his project was to gather these photographs and make murals. World War II put a stop to that. And that was the end of the Park Service or the Interior Department project. After the war in 1946, uh, he applied for a Guggenheim Fellowship and the project was to photograph the, the National Parks and Monuments around the United States. And he did that, he got a, he got a second Guggenheim. And from that, he published some books, he published portfolios that showed a lot of the, the National Park that he was very happy to, you know, and pleased and was excited him. And I know on that project, we would come back up here a couple of times and go on to Yellowstone and Glacier and so, <clears throat> I don't think he was here before 1942. I know for sure. But I have great memories of those trips. So. Yes. 
Uh, he's a great photographer and great innovator in that art. If he was alive today, what would he be doing with digital photography? <laughs> that, that is the best question and it's asked almost every time that I give a talk on Anson. I think he would love it. One year before he died, BBC interviewed him. And we saw this three, four, or five years ago now. We saw the tape from this interview, and they were talking about electronic photography in 1983, which was in the process, but not, you know, not developed. He was all excited about it. And he loved science, he loved the gimmicks, he loved the, what was going on in the world, and he would probably love the digital world. He got a, he got a, he used to type, he was a terrible typer, and then all the errors, you know, had the, when he wanted to make a copy, had to be erased. And he got somewhere along the way a word processor, probably in the early 80s. And he was fascinated with the word processor because, look, if I make a mistake, I can delete, put in the right thing. And he was always showing people his word processor. Well, he got involved with Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs liked his work. And uh, Jobs was going to get him his first Mac in 1984 <laughs> when the Mac came out. Unfortunately, Ansel died before he got that. But Steve Jobs loved Ansel, and if you go to the App Store, there's at least three apps that they Apple has produced on Ansel. So, uh, and Ansel's, our Steve Jobs' house is full of Ansel's work. I met Steve Jobs around well, 1980, no, 19, late 1900, late 1990s. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and his wife stimulated the California Hall of Fame. It, it, it started, and they wanted to induct Ansel into the California Hall of Fame, of course, as, you know, as he passed away. But I was invited to receive the award for uh, that, and it was really fun. Steve Jobs was getting inducted too, and the first thing he said to me, he said, my God, my house is just full of Ansel. <laughs> so what it's worth. But I actually ran into to Arnold in Sun Valley three or four days ago. We were on our way up here, and here was, here's Arnold. Yeah. Uh, I said, you know, hello, and I thought, do you remember that? And he said, oh, <laughs> it is Austrian accent. <laughs> but digital would have been, I think, really fun. And if Adobe Workshop people, Adobe people came down to our house in Carmel several years ago to see the dark room. And if you are familiar with uh, Adobe, they use the little symbols, like the for dodging and burning, in their process. And I'm pretty sure when Dad would have loved that. Science intriguing. And the other thing about his uh, background in that innovation was the Polaroid system. He got involved with Polaroid in 1949, and when Dr. Land, he met Dr. Land in the uh, Boston area, Cambridge, uh, they started talking, and he remained a consultant the rest of his life. And I was a beneficiary of that because they sent him all the film that they were testing, and he couldn't take it, couldn't use it all. And he gave me an early Polaroid. He would just, when the film was out of date, he just sent it to me, so I had unlimited supplies of Polaroid film. The thing I didn't know is, didn't know what film speed it was. It could be a 2,000 film speed, so the first picture you took with it, you, know, you had to decide what, how, to, how to expose. But it was, it was a great source of film for me, and a lot of fun. But he was excited about that process. And for the rest of his life, he was involved, very much involved with Polaroid development and helped him develop the SX-70 camera, which is the flat one, and develop some of the new film. So, yes, the answer about for what do you like, digital and uh, electronic photography, yes, I know. Yes? Are there any, um, I haven't looked at, the, at this exhibit carefully enough to know the answer to this question. Are there any iconic photographs that are of landscapes that we should maybe point out to the visitors um, that would be, you know, on a car with his uh, Snake River? I don't think so. 
so he, you know, this was more of a personal trip. There's some, the one here of the glacier polish in the lateral fork, there's one on the end. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very popular image, and uh, it, it's kind of an exciting thing to see. Uh, he's got a couple of these others that are of the mountains themselves, but I don't think uh, any of these would be considered one of the major yeah. photographs. Uh, nothing like the snake river. That's a special one yes. itself. Well, I. Yeah. Are, you mentioned the red filter and that sort of thing. Are the details of the photographs available somewhere? Or the exposures and what there's kind of a, a book thing? that was produced entitled Examples, and it took most of his major photographs and it talked about the technical aspect. Of it. That's the best source of information that I can give you today. If I'm sure, if you could look at one of these and in the public domain somewhere, it might give you more information. His archive is in uh, Tucson, at the University of Arizona, the Center for Creative Photography. They have his entire negative collection and prints, everything he really did. They probably could give you a, an answer for a specific image. Uh, he only, like, he has about 40,000 negatives. But there's only 2,500 of them ever been printed. So it's not that huge a Now, 2,500 maybe that have been produced uh, to show. I don't think you would count these in that 2,500 because, I mean, these were one of the kinds in many ways for these, especially the portraits and the you know, snapshot type. But yes, I, if you need the information, the Center for Creative Photography can probably give you the Answer. So, yeah. What was he like as a father, and maybe one of your, you know, memories that, you know, I think uh, of my dad and, you know, the way that. Well, he wasn't a typical father. <laughs> he, didn't he didn't go to ball games, and, but he took me, he included me in the things that he was doing, and I, that was fascinating for me. I, I. On my own, I joined the softball team and the, the, that sort of thing. But Ansel wasn't, he didn't fish. But he loved fish by caught trout. He took pictures, he loved hiking, and that was a wonderful part of my growing up because I would go to all of these places that he was headed. And uh, my mom was quite a hiker in her days. And actually, she climbed a lot before they were married and has several first ascents in the Sierra. Uh, as a rock climber. That's before the, these things where they're hanging on vertical walls. But, uh, she, she really loved that kind of work. And, uh, you know, we, my sister and I are the beneficiaries of that. But as far as being a typical father, I, the most important thing I can say is that he included me in what he was doing and took me on a lot of the trips. And uh, he took me to Alaska in 1947. And these were really neat experiences for somebody who's young. I was an inexpensive camera bearer, <laughs> <laughs> unpaid, but I was taking all these trips and uh, I, I, I got a lot out of it. But I, I think if any of you have a chance to read the Ansel Adams autobiography, I don't know whether you're carrying it in the store. I know it's still in, in soft cover. Available a lot of these stories about the Sierra, about photography in general, his connection with George O'Keefe and, and Albert Stieglitz, his early years in uh, Polaroid, and, and these. There's really good stories within that book, and I would recommend that if you want to know more about it. And you probably can Google. So anyway. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time.
have fond memory, memories of this museum. And congratulations on the work you're doing. And uh, I suspect that uh, this will draw a number of people to it. Yes. Thank you anyway. Okay. If any of you are going to be there tonight, you'll hear him playing the piano. Too. Yes. <laughs>